welcome to Final Adjudication. I'm your host, Nicholas Hawks. On tonight's episode, we discuss a number of issues currently being debated in the American political arena. The first is the Second Amendment, the right to keep and to bear arms. Just how far does this right go? We also explore the recent proposals at the national and local level here in the Commonwealth about restricting the use of guns. We also go into the issue of women in combat, the Pentagon's recent repeal of the ban. Is this a good idea? Is it about achieving equality? And is it really going to enhance America's military fighting capabilities? Our expert panel weighs in. Final adjudication, where we weigh both sides of the issues and let you make the final adjudication. Welcome to Final Adjudication. Joining us here tonight are two professors at the Massachusetts School of Law. The first, a criminal law professor and retired Massachusetts State Trooper, Alfred Puller. Thank you for joining us. Glad to be here, sir. We also have constitutional law scholar, Connie Rudnick. Thank you again for coming. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Now, on the other side, we also have a student at the Massachusetts School of Law, Jody Girardi, who is also a veteran of the first Gulf War. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. And we have the executive director of the Gun Owners Action League, Jim Wallace. Thanks for having me on the show. Not a problem. On tonight's episode, we're going to delve into the Second Amendment. So I want to start first by reading what the Second Amendment states, and then we can get a constitutional interpretation of what that law means. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the defense of a free state, the right of the people <coughs> to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Let's start first with our constitutional law professor. What's your interpretation of that? Well, my interpretation is different from the majority of the Supreme Court's interpretation. Um, the Supreme Court has held that there is an individual right to bear arms. They held it in a, it was a, under very limited circumstances that there was a, a, a fundamental right to bear handguns, to have, possess, and use handguns in the home for self-defense. That's the holding of the two cases that have already been decided. Um, the, just because the, the language of the amendment says shall not be infringed um, does not mean that it cannot be subject to regulation. And the court admitted as much in the decision itself. Uh, it indicated that there had been some long-standing regulations. The Heller decision. The decision. There had been some long-standing regulations um, uh, concerning uh, um, the commercial sale of firearms, background checks, uh, felons in possession, uh, keeping uh, guns uh, out of the hands of mentally ill p people. And I think that we all agree that the mentally ill should not possess firearms. Uh, see, I don't know if another one of our panel um, members would agree with that. Well, let's go to Jim, because he might have a different interpretation of what the Second Amendment says. So tell me, what is your interpretation of the second. Well, a absolutely. It's an individual civil right, you know, one that's paramount, certainly in all of our rights here in, in the United States and in Massachusetts. Uh, there have been laws on the books for quite some time as far as who can and can't own firearms, and that's constantly debated both on the state level and the federal level. I know here in Massachusetts, we've actually been working with the government for over a decade to try to come up with some answers about responding to the mental health issue, which has been pretty much the discussion nationwide since a lot of the tragedies and murders that have happened across the country. In almost every single case, it seems to have been a person with severe mental health issues. So gun owners actually going all the way back to two, the year 2000, which then we had the Edgewater Technology murders, uh, where the, the, the gentleman that the press named Mucko went in and killed seven of his co-workers. Uh -huh. We actually had a meeting with Governor Jane Swift at that time and urged her to put together a commission of experts, of mental health experts, criminologists, and whoever else they needed uh -huh. to see if we could identify these people up front and to prevent them from having access not just to guns, but to anything that might cause harm to themselves or others. Can I, can I respond? Sure. Um, I, 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 uh, glad that you've taken that position. I do have a question, though, as to why your organization has been a leader in um, uh, keeping Massachusetts from changing its me uh, mental health access 
um, uh, records that m the vast majority of other states share their mental health records with the FBI in order to sure. do background checks, and the Gun Owners Action yep. League has been instrumental in mm -hmm. keeping Massachusetts from um, uh, sharing our mental health records. And I'd like to know if there's uh, if there is mm -hmm. a, a happy medium that you can achieve, mm -hmm. and why is your organization taking that position mm -hmm. when, in fact, it is mm -hmm. the mentally ill a that actually, we have to be careful the, of. The, the position is incorrect. We had we fought against the governor's bill, which was written incorrectly. The governor's bill was supposed to be about people who were adjudicated as mentally ill and not capable of handling their affairs. And those people would be added to the next check. The problem is the governor's intro letter, which most people read, says adjudicated, but the bill said confined. And when we testified before the Judiciary Committee, no one could give us a term of what confined meant. Because our concern was, wait a minute, are you, does confined mean that an officer took somebody into, and I hope I'm using the right term, pr protective custody overnight until they had a hearing. Does that mean confined? Does that mean those people are going to go in the next checks? And absolutely not. We, we cannot allow that to happen. But if the, if the bill was changed, we would be tremendously supportive of it. There are other things in the bill that unless you read the details of it, you know, was, well, we don't really need to deal with that right now because that's more. Jim, let's uh, get a little of bit argument. of a, a law sure. enforcement background in on this. Um, Professor Puller, what is your take on the Second Amendment? Uh, based on your background, I mean, what is the right of an individual to keep and bear arms? I don't have, uh, as far as the Second Amendment's right to bear arms, I don't take any issue with that. Uh, my real concern, both as a private citizen and as having spent half my life as a state police officer, uh, is the, the, the ability to regulate and what are we speaking of as arms? Can I have a howitzer in my garage? Well, what, where, does, uh, where should the distinction be drawn? I mean, what is an acceptable level of firearm that an individual should be able to possess in their home? I don't like to do the revisionist thing, but when we think about, when we're here from Massachusetts, when I think about Concord and, and the Minutemen, those were personal arms that they generally had that they kept at home, and because they needed arms for a lot of other reasons besides just serving as, as uh, on-call on call, uh, uh, soldiers, if you will. Uh, but they generally had, they were generally personal weapons. And of course, we didn't, there, was, there wasn't even a Gatlin gun, so never mind uh, a weapon that can fire uh, 60 rounds in a, in a minute or something. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were personal weapons for, that an individual soldier would have in combat. We have, but times have changed, and well, we have to take that into Let's talk about the times changing, because Senator Feinstein has just uh, proposed a, a new bill in Congress which is going to essentially limit the sale, purchase, importation, manufacture, or transfer of semi-automatic semi -automatic pistols, shotguns, and rifles. Mm -hmm. Now, just to educate the viewer, a semi a, I can't even pronounce it, a semi-automatic gun is a firearm in which a shell is ejected and the next round of ammunition is loaded automatically from a magazine or clip. The trigger must be pulled for each shot. And so her bill would totally get rid of any new types of these semi-automatic semi guns. I hope this isn't contagious. Uh, <laughs> and it would also um, register all firearms that are grandfathered in. Now let's talk, is this a good idea? It, among other things in this bill, is, uh, this, is this bill going to do enough is it going too I, I far? Don't have, I don't have an answer. I, I, I've done research over the years, and, and you can find them. It depends on whose website you go on as to what information you get and what statistics. Uh, if you want to go on a, on a pro-gun control website, they'll cite the fact that since the assault weapon ban was allowed to lapse, um, the number of, of mass deaths, however you define that, or deaths from assault weapons uh, has increased dramatically. The problem is that the vast majority of um, deaths it, um, uh, in this country are from handguns, and that's what the Supreme Court has said is an ordinary weapon mm. to which the fundamental right attaches. And, and well, you're so, talking about handguns. Yeah, and, and that's, not, that's not what what Feinstein has proposed, as far as I understand it. Well, her so her, her, she's proposed something mm -hmm. which 
sounds good, but it's really not getting to the problem. And I'm not suggesting that there's an easy answer to the handgun problem because mm -hmm. the handguns are in the hands of people who aren't, except when they use it illegally, aren't running around saying, here I am Let's with a handgun. Let's go to Jim because I want to hear what he has to say about the bill. Sure. Well, I mean, we have bills on, on the federal level, the state level. Uh, we have bills from local legislators. And there's a whole host of, of proposals, if you will, uh, that unfortunately seem to go more after the individual lawful gun owner than it does anything else. One of the things that really concerns me in Massachusetts is the lack of attention to what I call the human criminal element. You know, one of the things I, I actually had a meeting a few years ago with officials that were running the state gun licensing system. And I asked them, can you tell me how many people applied for a license and got it in the past two years? And they said, sure, we can give you those numbers. And then I said, can you tell me how many people have applied for a gun license and were denied and why they were denied? And they said, no, we don't keep that information. Really? So you're wasting millions of dollars tracking the good guys and you don't have any kind of database on the prohibited persons who should not be in possession of guns or anything else for that matter. I wanna, and that's disturbing. I want to um, go to Alfred on this one. Based on your experience in law enforcement, do gang members have much trouble getting a hold of firearms? I would say it appears not. I mean, uh, in my, in my uh, time with the state police, there, uh, when I originally came to the state police, we carried uh, revolvers, six round revolvers. And the guns on the street that were being used, they were getting into automatics and Uzis. We were in situations where basically we're overpowered. And not just our agency, the very same thing, one of the worst uh, shootouts for the FBI, I think it was in Florida, uh, they were actually outgunned by the perpetrators. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, you know, I have a concern for that. But on the other hand, I, I, the question you're answering, do they have, seem to have problems getting guns? The answer is no. Because so they, they manufacture this, far more guns than are than a really sold on the legitimate would market. Would Senator Feinstein's bill Here. hurt the law-abiding citizen more than it would hurt a gang member? My response would be no. Because the people who are it would, regulation is not going to hurt a legitimate gun, gun owner. Mm -hmm. I think that with, with newer legislation and requiring, uh, requiring registration and identification, uh, uh, it, I gotta, like, I, like gun shows and the likes. I got I I go to go to my exit on the question on the topic, okay. guys, and just a yes or no question. Okay. We'll start first with Connie. Does, a, does Senator Feinstein's gun bill or a similar one pass Congress and get signed into law by President Obama? No. Just a yes or no prediction. <laughs> I'm going to have to go with no. 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 Okay. Jody, thanks for weighing in on that issue. We're going um, <laughs> to talk about women in combat and the Pentagon's repeal now. We were just talking about handguns. When you were in the military, you told me before the show, women were issued a different caliber gun than their male counterparts, correct? Yes. Back in 1989, when I joined the service, women were issued a revolver, and the male counterpart was issued a 45. And what was the um, final determination about this policy? I don't know if it was a policy, but when we deployed to the Persian Gulf, it made sense, it was logic, that if you're in combat and you run out of ammunition and where you have a revolver and you're only using a couple bullets, where are you going to turn if the guy you're fighting next to is carrying a 45? So it has to be compatible along the lines. So we thus were issued, upon deployment, a 45. Okay. Now, let's just talk about the repeal. Now, women have been serving in combat situations in Iraq and Afghanistan for quite some time. 136 women have uh, died since we've initiated these two wars, so it's not like they're not seeing any type of military action. What do you think the main goal of this repeal the ban is in the Pentagon? Is it about equality? Is it about boosting troop levels? I mean, what is, why are they coming up? It's the right up? thing to do. There are advantages and benefits that soldiers get by being combat veterans. They get promotions, they get raises, they are eligible for uh, honors, awards, etc. that people who do not see combat are not. 
And I know both from knowing Jody for several years and other women who are in the military, that they're putting their lives in the exact same places as men are. And because they are not denominated combat forces, they don't get these benefits. And if they're doing the work and they're out there laying their lives on the line for this country, they ought to get the same opportunities as men do. I, I just think it's rank discrimination not to. Well, and I'm going to go back to Jody because based on your experiences, you know, um, is this is the repeal of the ban going to enhance the military fighting capability of this country? I think absolutely. I, I personally cannot find any logical reason why women should not be allowed to join combat forces. Should it be all women units or should it be It must women be unit and cohesion. And, that, and that's the problem and that has always been the problem is when if you train separately, you won't be able to fight together. Mm -hmm. And people have to earn respect from one another. If you train with your male counterpart, he can see that you're capable, that you have the ability. There'll be that respect, respect you know, overseas as well. And um, enhancing, we have the greatest military in the world. Mm -hmm. And deploying um, women into these positions will only make it better. Now, Jim, you're a veteran yourself. What's your take on the repeal of the ban? Well, it's kind of interesting because you have a few different dynamics that you're facing right now. First of all, we don't fight wars on a front line like we used to. There really is no safe zone when you're deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan or, or those areas. There is no safe zone. There's really no behind the line. So mm -hmm. anybody and everybody that's deployed over there should have the ability to, to combat when they need to. Uh, one of the things that they talked about when I was in the service wasn't the ability or inability of the women to actually fight. It was the psychology of the men that were in the units because for a time millennium, you know, the, the male psychology is to protect and defend. And back then the conversation was, would men put themselves at greater risk trying to save a female counterpart in their unit than they would an, uh, another, another man? So I think that's something that needs to be at least addressed, but we have come so far as a society, and I gotta tell you firsthand, even back then, there was a lot of women that I was in the military with that I'd rather have in the foxhole with me fighting than a couple of guys that I knew. So uh, as far as their ability, I have no doubt of their ability. Sure, Al. Well, yeah. I'm a non-vet, but nevertheless, I, as I said, I, I was 27 years in the state police, and I can see a lot of, a lot of similarities between the two. And of course, I, I have familiarity with that. I've read books and seen movies. But listen to Do Jody, uh, issues like same ammo, training together, that's very important. I, in fact, was one of the first classes in the state police to have women in a state police class. Mm -hmm. Jody, how will some women that are not able to, say, perhaps carry a 70-pound pack, be able to run and fight with uh, other individuals in the military who are able to do such a thing? When you are in a situation, um, training and physical standards and so forth, the, the standards are different among the ages of men. You said that, yes. You know, 25-year-old mm -hmm. to a 19-year-old man, they have different physical standards. Okay. Okay? Male and female have different standards, but this is a different type. This is a different type of world. This is a different mm -hmm. type of war. It's it's not uh, brute strength anymore. You know, technology, brains. You know, um, oh, I agree. And, and do I think that? Oh, okay. The Congress is going to open up the door, so all women should be allowed to to walk into combat. No, that's not mm -hmm. what I'm saying. I'm saying if they're capable, if they're confident, if they, have the if they have the qualifications to make it into that specific unit that they're applying for, absolutely. But if they can't handle it, just like the, a guy that can't get mm -hmm. in it, they don't right. deserve to have the position. This is the same, that's the same uh, excuse that was given when they tried to integrate the police, when, I mean integrate gender integration. Mm -hmm. The police, the fire department, oh, we can't have women firefighters because they can't carry, uh, um, uh, do dead man's carry. So you got, the, whatever is a, what, what's called a bona fide occupational qualification. If you have to, and I emphasize have to, if you have to be able to bench press 300 pounds in order to do your job, and there isn't a woman who can bench press 300 pounds in order to, and you have to be able to do that, then there can't be a woman just like there couldn't be a man who couldn't bench press. We're going to get to our exit question. That's a good point. We're out of time, I'm afraid, Alfred. Oh. Um, another prediction, yes or no question. Does Congress pass an amnesty or an immigration reform plan within the next 60 days, which is signed into law by the President? We'll start first with Connie. Yes.
I'm going to go yes on that one. Yes. No. The answer is no. And as an exit question for the show, because in uh, just a few days we're going to be watching the Super Bowl, I wanted to get everyone's Super Bowl winner prediction. We'll start first with Jody. If the Patriots aren't playing, who cares? Okay, fair enough. San Francisco. I'm with the Patriots. I stopped watching football two weeks ago. Oh, okay. So I, 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 is there a Super Bowl coming up? <laughs> <laughs> Not me. I like it no matter who's playing. San Francisco. That's wrong. It's going to be the Ravens. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in tonight. Aren't we Have a wonderful evening.